Well, the Russia-Ukraine war has highlighted the levels of risk and global conflict we saw in 2022. Will that change next year as we turn the calendar to 2023? Pleasure to be joined by Whit Hennish, who is a professor of management, as well as vice dean and faculty director of the ESG initiative at the Wharton School. Vit, great to talk to you again. Pleasure to be on your show again, Dan. Uh, this obviously, it feels like it is a year where we have seen much more conflict just in general. How have you viewed the, what has occurred over this last year? Unfortunately, I think it's a precursor of some difficult times to come. Uh, I think we've had a reawakening that uh, conflict, violent conflict, even on the European continent is possible. Uh, and as we look ahead to 2023, uh, I think the likelihood that we're struggling more in the international economy with political risk, uh, even to the point of violent conflict, is increasing dramatically. Should it be surprising, especially to see something like this occur on the European continent, as far as we've kind of come, and, and kind of the way that countries and, and thought processes of leadership have developed over the last couple of decades? I mean, absolutely. The the foundation of what is now the European Union at the time, the European coal and steel community in the 50s, was designed to make sure that never again would there be um, violent conflict on the European continent, how to bridge these economies uh, together, how to make them interdependent on each other, how to make sure uh, that it was never in anyone's interest again to, to raise the, the tools of war against their neighbors. Uh, and we've seen that break down uh, and break down really dramatically in a way that um, most thought were was not possible or most thought was extremely unlikely. Are there things that that as this is all played out, are there things that you look at and and areas that could have been focused on more to try and prevent it? Obviously, the challenge, especially with Russia, Ukraine, is obviously the leader of Russia and, and his kind of one path philosophy in terms of the kind of the, the the realm that he wants to have for his country? Well, it's hard to roll the clock back and uh, imagine what the world could have been like uh, if there had been more uh, more of a line in the sand and, and more uh, engagement when Russia followed similar tactics uh, in Georgia uh, and in Crimea earlier. Uh, and, you know, at the time, there wasn't any appetite to do more. Uh, there was a sense of, well, we'll let this go or we'll let this happen. Um, and no one was really saying this was the moment. So so I think it's a, it's a little much to go back in time and say, if only. But, but I think given where we are now, you can go back and start thinking, you know, should we have been stronger at the time uh, the Crimean Peninsula was taken or that Western Ukraine was taken? Or even in some of the, the actions in Georgia several years ago around the time of the Olympics um, or uh, right before the Olympics in, in Russia. Uh, those were moments that certainly could have changed Putin's decision making uh, this year. Uh, but uh, I understand why at that time, no one was willing to escalate that dramatically. So while that is going on, there is also the concern about the relations between the U.S. and China. And obviously, when you're talking about that part of the world, there's obviously a lot of focus around Taiwan uh, and what what the path for that nation is going to be in the years ahead. Yeah, and I think we should you know view those as two separate questions, although they're obviously related. Uh, we're seeing a, a split of uh, China from the global economy, from the U.S. and the global economy, uh, not obviously at the same level of Russia, but we're starting to see the antecedents of a, of a separation uh, in terms of uh, certainly high technology trade, you know, the ban on Huawei and, and some of the concerns around national security, bringing some of the factories home in the chip manufacturing and other sector, the, the idea of near shoring or friend shoring. Uh, so that sense that the global economy continues by making China more interdependent with the global economy, uh, and that's a source of benefits for consumers in the U.S., consumers around the world, uh, is really changing. And the question is, how far does that go? Uh, now, adding to that question of, of what happens as China starts withdrawing from certain elements of global supply chain is how does China navigate the short-term uh, growth implications of that combined with the challenges of zero COVID? So the current best forecasts for Chinese growth are around two or two and a half percent, which is unprecedentedly low. Uh, you know, in the US would be pretty happy with two and a half percent growth over a couple of years. But in China, there's become an expectation of you know six, seven, eight, nine percent growth. Now it sounds like, oh, so what? They're going down to 2.4%, but they're making all sorts of uh, internal deals and compromises on the idea of rapid growth as that becomes less plausible uh, or even impossible uh, to maintain. 
how will the internal political system uh, refocus or rebalance? And unfortunately, one of the ways it could do that is by a distraction of a nationalist uh, show of force. Uh, and this is the time we take Taiwan. Uh, and, and so as we're both seeing a disengagement of China and internal political challenges, uh, the, the possibility, and I, I still think it's a remote one in the short term, uh, of a move on Taiwan starts increasing in possibility. And, and I think also the fact that we saw this in Russia makes people start planning for, thinking about the possibility that it could happen in China. Uh, so, so the you know the, the two questions are uh, at some level related, but it's also important to note that the structural uh, division between the U.S. and China is going to happen no matter what, even if we don't see an escalation of violent conflict in the area. Well, realistically, aren't the two related? It feels like from the perspective of what President Xi Jinping may be viewing going on in Russia and Ukraine as a path of whether or not he makes that move or he you know has the the, the want to make that move towards taiwan in the years ahead it may, may be the factor of him doing it or not doing it I think absolutely. You know, China's uh, very good about learning from the past and learning from history. Uh, you know, more more dissertations written on the fall of empires and the fall of leading powers in China than in the rest of the world combined over the last decade. And so they're acutely aware of, of the lessons of both distant and recent history. And I'm sure they're studying quite closely how the West has responded to, to the challenge of Ukraine. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, on any analytic grounds, if you look at the cohesion that the European Union has maintained and that the U.S. has maintained to support uh, um, Ukraine, uh, it should give pause uh, to any rational analysis of an attack on uh, Taiwan. Now, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, we go beyond that short-term rational calculus, but the updating has got to be one of uh, more in the direction of caution uh, than aggression. I, I think it also brings focus on the relationships that countries have with each other in terms of either helping to try and eliminate some of these conflicts going on or managing the process of, of easing the pain from these as well. Partnerships that the U.S. have had, say, with the European Union or what could have been uh, with, uh, you know, over with other countries over in, in Asia as well. These could be very vital elements uh, to try and help the U.S. as it moves forward with some of these issues. You know, it's a great point, and it really points to the the importance of uh, multilateral engagement, of being part of NATO, of, of being part of the conversation uh, around security in Europe, uh, and also being part of the conversation in Asia, whether it's in ASEAN uh, or other institutions that have been built up over time there, uh, to make sure we have the relationships with the governments, with the leaders, with the business leaders, uh, to, to try to present the U.S. view in a way that's um, uh, more mediated by locals and more mediated by trusted locals and trusted power brokers. Uh, all the sense of, uh, you know, America first and, and bringing everything back, uh, what happens in the U.S. is acutely influenced by what happens in the rest of the world. Uh, and if we don't maintain those relationships, if we don't build those uh, ties uh, to leaders abroad, we're much less able to influence what's happening uh, abroad that does have dramatic impacts on the U.S. economy and on the U.S. population. Is there something that you see kind of within the culture of our globe right now that is kind of leading to maybe the 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 arrogance or the the want by some leaders to to kind of make these pushes to to want to go forward and try and and, and capture these territories or or make these moves to gain uh further control over a particular area well i think the America first ideology and the growth of populism, nationalism, and nativism broadly, the fact that every country seems to be more focused on what's going on at home, uh, gives people who want to make an aggressive move a little more comfort that they may not draw the ire of the U.S. or they might not draw the ire of NATO because those countries are more focused on their home uh, on their home field. And so maybe this is the time to make a play. Maybe this is the time to undertake some sort of aggression. I think that's really dangerous. And, and so, you know, it's sort of an extension of the last point you made that if not only do we not maintain the relationships, but we shift the focus back to the home front, it actually increases the probability that more aggressive leaders in the world will take action because they feel the cost to them are less. Uh, and so we really not only need to maintain those relationships, we need to get out of the mindset uh, that we can just focus on the home economy and, and that won't create any problems uh, internationally and domestically. So as we turn the calendar to 2023, it doesn't feel like a lot, at least 
immediately is going to change. And this is kind of a pattern that has developed and will be with us for a little while. But there is obviously, I would think, an opportunity there at some point to make some moves that that could potentially change the landscape a little bit more towards the positive. Well, it's going to be a challenging time to do that. And, and let's just lay out, a, let me lay out a couple of the reasons why. You raised the the growth shortfall or the challenges of the Chinese economy. We discussed those a little bit earlier. A lot of the growth that the global economy has experienced over the last 5, 10, even 20 years has been driven by Chinese demand. And now we're starting to see that Chinese demand slow. That means that uh, Brazil, Turkey, many of the other, you know, South Africa, many of the other big emerging markets in the world aren't going to be able to count on that rising Chinese demand and that, that ability to tap into global growth. And so the the challenges or the imperfections in each of those three economies and, and many others, I mean, you know, perhaps dozens of others, you can't mask that with high growth or high global demand. And so when there's a crisis, you know, when there's 80% inflation as there is in Turkey right now, uh, if there are challenges, uh, you know, in Brazil, uh, as Lula uh, assumes leadership uh, with a new presidency, there isn't going to be ability to grow out of that. There are going to be much greater constraints on each of those leaders, and a single mistake or a single scandal could have much larger impacts in terms of uh, a financial crisis, in terms of a growth slowdown, which could bring people out into the streets. And so we have a much more fragile system because we're not growing as rapidly as the global economy, and a lot of that has to do with China. So one of the big differences going forward in 2023 uh, is both the Russia-Ukraine situation and the U.S.-China split are creating a much lower growth potential for the economy as a whole, meaning any one country in the world has a much more fragile uh, state in, and uh, much more potential to uh, have a crisis. Uh, we're going to see global interest rates going up to combat inflation. That's only going to exacerbate those challenges because many of these countries are heavily leveraged and uh, could face currency crises as interest rates go up. So you've got both political, economic, and sort of monetary fragility all wrapped up into one and a transition in Brazil and uh, a Turkish election later this year as well. Uh, it, it's a bad recipe in some of the leading emerging markets. I think that's, I think we forget sometimes how what goes on, you know, with countries at the larger scope does have that trickle down effect through, you know, other levels, other sizes of countries as well, that everyone seemingly is impacted by some of these elements. Absolutely. And you can take that argument a step further. I mean, if Brazil slows down or if Brazil goes into crisis, what does that do for other countries in Latin America? Uh, if Turkey goes into uh, crisis, what does that do for other countries in the Middle East uh, and North Africa? Uh, and obviously, the, you know, the implications of China uh, for Southeast Asia are, are go without saying. So, so each of the effects that I just described, the global effect trickling down to the biggest emerging markets, uh, same with South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, also occurs at a regional level. And so if you have a crisis in the largest economy uh, and the anchor economy of a continent, uh, that will ripple through the smaller economies of that continent.